Okay, all right. All right, all right. Everyone thank Paige. I appreciate it. Thank you, Paige. I've known Paige since she was in middle school. So um, it's good to have uh, Paige. I'm what? All the way around? Am I really? Oh, wow, embarrassing. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Welcome, Mission Church. How are, are you kidding me? Am I really? Half turn. All right. <laughs> we'll get this right once now. All right. Welcome, Mission Church. How are you? Are you kidding me right now? Am I really? Wow. All right, all right. Welcome, Mission Church. How are you? It's bound to get that right one of these times. All right. One out of four ain't bad. So on that note, let me ask you. Do you ever feel like you're going through life in the wrong direction? Do you ever feel like you're walking through life in the dark? Busyness, hardships, difficult circumstances, blinded by the circumstances, like you're, like you're wearing a blindfold, right? Like you're walking through life with a blindfold on. Sometimes we get so consumed by these things. Some of these circumstances are so close that we can't see anything. It's so close. It's like we can't see the forest through the trees, or we can't see the joy through the circumstances. But when you take a step back, when you take the blindfold off, and we focus on God, focus on what he wants us to see, we have a new perspective. When we're focused on what he wants to see, we're able to walk through life knowing that he's in control, that he has a path for us. We're able to be reminded of his love, reminded of his grace and mercy, reminded of why we're here, and that's to share his love, to share his hope, and to share his joy. All right, this morning, I'm gonna get you guys, you guys started early, okay? So pull out your notes, pull out your pens. If you take notes on the app, you guys can pull that, the, the, your phone out because your first feeling is right now. Circumstances may blind us, but God's love reminds us, all right? Circumstances may blind us, but God's love reminds us. That's gonna be kind of a running theme throughout this message, and I hope you're able to take that home with you today. And so my encouragement to start us off is, let's be reminded not blinded. For those who have been here for any period of time, you understand that I like to use object lessons in my messages, all right? If you're a guest with us or if you've never heard me teach, no, I'm not crazy. My wife and kids may think I am, but that's a whole message in itself, all right? But I understand, I, there's, there is a method to my madness, and I really am glad that you've chosen to join us today. And so, well, like, I, like I said, we're going to focus on God's love which allows us to see the joys through the circumstances as opposed to being blinded by the circumstances. And within that, I wanna spend some time in God's word and to dive in specifically what, to what he has to say about joy and laughter and how they pertain not only to life, but how they pertain to our spiritual journey. You see, these are gifts from God and we need to recognize that. And as, as they, they help us with, with his, enjoying his creation. They help us with a, an outpouring of an expression of, of happiness and enjoyment and encouragement, a way to release the stress of life. I mean, I mean it's been medically proven that joy and laughter improves health, blood sugar levels, immune system responses, sleep patterns. They're good for you. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine. God created joy and laughter. He was intentional with giving us these tools to help us navigate through life. And joy and laughter, as Christians, joy and laughter are two of the best tools that we can use in sharing our faith. But probably the two tools that we use the least. You see, the weight of this world can be heavy. 
sometimes dark. Sometimes the uncertainty, the circumstances cause us to miss the joy of God's love. Blinds us, so to speak, right? We can't see anything else but our own problems. Sometimes we get, we get consumed, sometimes selfishly consumed, and it's, and it's displayed with a heavy attitude. But if we walk through life with this heavy attitude, we're not gonna be able to see God's joy. The more that we focus on God, the more that we're in his word, in prayer, the closer that our relationship gets, the more we know his love, the more we know and are reminded of his love for us. And the easier it is for, for us to find that joy and laughter, for us to be able to, to, to go through life with a different perspective. And in return, it allows us to be a true light to those who live in a dark world. So let's be reminded, not blinded. Studies have shown that children on average laugh 150 times per day. Adults, on the other hand, often barely make it to double digits. In fact, one study says, get this, that adults laugh on average three times per day. That's crazy. Some of you have already used up your allotted laughter today, so put it away, no more, all right? But as I get it, as we grow older, the weight of this world can kind of, we feel the pressure. We, we, we feel the, the heaviness, some the, sometimes the heartaches of life. We have traffic to deal with and bills to pay and rude people and sometimes health issues. But if we're not careful, we'll look up one day and we won't smile as much. We're not as happy, rarely laugh, Rarely enjoy what we're going through because there's too much pressure, too much responsibility for us to enjoy life. And it starts to consume us. Circumstances may blind us from seeing the joy. But God didn't create you with the heaviness. He created you to live life with joy. And as Christ's followers here on earth, we are called to represent Christ and to share his faith. So rejoice, right? As, as, as Christ followers, as believers, sometimes we need to notify our face and smile more. Think about it. A simple smile in the grocery store line or in the bank or at the workplace. Not only does it change your attitude, but the simple gesture can change someone else's day for the better. The scripture says, a joyful heart is like medicine. So take your medicine every day, all right? And Paul, Paul mentions in Ephesians 6 about putting on the full armor of God, the belt of truth and the, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword, right? He talks about us putting on that daily. Well, in a similar sense, we also need to put on joy on a daily basis. We need to put on that smile. We need to put on laughter glasses because they help us with vision, allow us to see that different perspective, allow us to go through life understanding that there's more. Joy and laughter are essential to the Christian life. The, the scriptures are clear that God's people are both commanded to rejoice, but also characterized by rejoicing. There are many things I love about my wife, Michelle, but one thing in particular is how she starts her day, with her coffee, with Jesus, and with rejoicing. And she puts on that armor, she puts on that smile, and I love her laugh. It's contagious. Isn't laughing contagious? And just, and, and watching her go through, she has kind of this, like this cute little giggle to start off with. But when she gets to laughing hard, she can't catch her breath. And so there's like this distinct teapot kind of laughter. It's like, all right. 
It's funny. It's contagious. I love it. Now, I'm notorious for scaring people. All right? You can ask my kids, ask my family. Shoot. Ask Pastor Tyler here. That was a couple of years ago, and that's kind of my go-to. My, all right? I, so I end up doing that and, and love that, but that's, that's a classic. <laughs> I make fun of Michelle's teapot laugh, but I sound like a hyena. But so Michelle hates to be scared, and she's always wanting to scare me back, always wanting to get me back. But poor thing, she's horrible at it because the thought of actually scaring me sends her over the edge. She could be hiding behind the door, waiting to scare me, but the anticipation of actually scaring me, she, she starts to laugh. As I'm walking around the corner, I hear the <laughs> She's a She hasn't scared me in 23 years because of it. Her laugh gives her away. But it's the cutest thing. I love it. And I love how contagious it is. We, we, talk, we talk to each other and we, we're so excited and sometimes we, we're like, I love to hear your laugh, especially when we're going through storms in life, when we're going through difficult times, when we're consumed by the circumstances. Because when we know that we're living with joy, we're reminded of the love that God feels for us. We're reminded of the joy that we're supposed to be living with every day. It helps our vision and it changes our perspective. In fact, that's your next fill in. Be intentional about starting your day with joy. It will help your vision and change your perspective. Now the enemy hates for us to be joyful, hates for us to start that day with joy. Can't stand to hear us laugh laughing with our spouse, laughing with our kids, having fun. He wants there to be pressure and tension. He wants us to be consumed by the darkness. He wants us to be consumed by the circumstances, like we're wearing a blindfold. He wants that blindfold on us. But to deal with this kind of spiritual warfare, we need to put on that armor that, got, that, that, that Paul talks about, right? Right? But we also need to be intentional about putting on joy every day. Remain focused on God so you, so you can see what he wants you to see. And so we're reminded of his love. Use a joyful heart in our spiritual warfare. Joy brings down walls. Yes, there's gonna be times that we, we, we deal with tension and stress times where we're, we're, we're succumbed to, to sadness and we're overwhelmed. In fact, the Bible says, not if, but when we go through trials and storms. In a world of sin and suffering and, and mess and misery, it's reassuring to know God's love for us. It's reassuring to know his peace and comfort. It's reassuring to know that joy isn't just possible but that it's an essential part of our life and our spiritual journey. And when we have a personal relationship with who? With Jesus. When we have that personal relationship with Jesus, we have the knowledge and hope that no matter what this world throws at us, that he's in control. He has us in his hands. He has a plan. And with that, knowing that, we can go through storms. We can be in the middle of a storm and have a joyful perspective. I mean, Jesus, his life set the tone in so many ways, but he was not blinded by the circumstances when he lived here. Even when he was on the cross, ignoring his own suffering, he responded out of love, with mercy. He was constantly reminded of his father's love and constantly reminded to show that love. He is a perfect example. His life is a perfect example of encouragement to be joyfully focused on God. 
Now, let me take kind of a, a slight turn here, but it's an important thought. Do you or have you ever wondered if Jesus laughed? I mean, we know that he, he cried. It says in John that Jesus wept, but there's no specific scripture that says that Jesus laughed. Now, the scriptures do say that he was both fully God and fully human, so outside of sinning, doesn't that mean that he would have done things similarly to us? But sometimes when we picture Jesus and we have him in our imagination, it may be a somber, stern, serious person that's only interested in the, the weighty issues of life and death and sin and sanctification. And now don't get me wrong, Jesus came for a purpose and he carried the weight and the sin of this world on his shoulders and we are eternally grateful. We are truly blessed by his love and his sacrifice. But does that mean that he didn't live with a joy-filled spirit? So again, I ask you, do you ever imagine Jesus laughing so hard that he had tears running down his cheeks? We know that he loved celebrations. I mean, shoot, his first miracle was turning water into wine at a, at a wedding to keep the celebration going. And people loved to be around him. He loved community. He loved building relationships and showing his love. We know that he loved children. Loves all the children of the world, red and yellow and black and white. They are precious in his sight. It's kind of catchy. We can make that a song. But we, the scripture says that Children wanted to be near him, and sometimes the disciples kind of pushed them back. They thought that Jesus had more important things to do than hold a child in his lap. But, but Jesus kind of, in some ways, kind of got on to his disciples. In fact, I mean, he says right here in Mark 10, 14, it says, when Jesus saw that this was happening, he said to his disciples, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. Jesus wasn't put off by kids running around or the, the joys and, and laughter and the giggles. I'm sure he, he, had, he had a sense of humor and he probably chased him and growled at him on his knees. And he loved to tell stories. I mean, he was the best. His parables are not only powerful and insightful and encouraging, but there's a hint of humor woven through if you read them. Plus, you can't tell me that a group of 13 guys can hang out all the time. You guys are starting to nod your head. You're like, yeah, I get it. 13 guys nod, hanging out all the time. Campfires at night, dinner together, and never had any fun or laugh. I can just imagine as they're eating and they're like, Jesus, can you pass the beans and see if we have any beans? And he's like, <laughs> Peter, we're gonna cut you off. We think you've had enough. Woo, ah! right? The point is, is that we know that Jesus wasn't a gloomy Messiah. Jesus was a joyful person, continually urging his followers to rejoice. John 15, 11 says right here, I have told you these things that you may be filled with not just joy, but that you'll be filled with my joy. That's important. Yes, your joy will overflow. And like we discussed earlier, Satan wants to steal that joy. But Jesus came so that we may have life and live it to the full. John 10, 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life. Another translation says abundant life. Again, we know the point is, is that Jesus wasn't a, a gloomy Messiah. His standard greetings to his disciples was rejoice. And so let's take his example. Let's, let's smile more. Let's laugh. Let's rejoice. As Christians, we should be the most happy, exceedingly glad, rejoiceful, joy-filled people there are. We have hope. And we know what our eternal outcome is. So live it out daily. So live it out so that others can see his light shining through so that others can see his joy. We have true hope in a savior that came for us. And true joy begins with knowing the creator, knowing the one who created you, knowing the one who loves you. 
So let's be reminded, not blinded. And then, and then there's the, the Bible, the most joyful book there is. God's, God's word is full of excitement and encouragement. It's, it gives us clear direction, clear instruction of how to live a joy-filled life. Laughter, joy, encouragement, rejoicing is commanded, not just suggested, is commanded throughout the entire Bible. Let me just give you a few verses here, just a few. Psalms 100 says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Shout for joy in your heart. Matthew 5 says, rejoice and be glad. Luke 6, 23 says, leap for joy. Luke 15 says, yes, joy is possible. Joy so rich and real that we turn to our friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me. True, the apostle Paul's favorite word was rejoice. He wrote most of the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, rejoice when? Always. Rejoice always. Philippians 4.4 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more verses and instances woven in and throughout God's word, encouraging us to rejoice. This book is an instruction manual for living a joy-filled life, for having rejoicing for our soul. I remember, however, when I was a boy, I went to a Christian school, and ironically enough, the, the class that I dreaded the most was a Bible class. And one day in specific, I remember this. Eighth grade, my cousin and I, who attended the same school with me, same Bible class, sits right next to me, which was always fun, not always wise, but it was always fun. But the main reason why I dreaded this class is because it was so boring. I mean, of any classes, the Bible class should have been filled with joy and fun and encouragement and excitement and, and should not have been boring, but it was. And it was mainly because, and I, just, I, I apologize for this, and I've actually apologized to her over the years, because of this older teacher, I say older, this older teacher who was um, not so joyful, all right? So me and my cousin, sometimes we had to create our own joy in that class. But this class was not the time for joy and laughter, according to our teacher, all right? And so there's one day, let me just kind of set the mood here. I'm sure we're taking a test, probably on the book of Leviticus, not the most exciting book in the Bible, but it doesn't surprise me that she chose it. And so as we're taking this test, I can hear my cousin trying to get my attention. Psst, Mark. Psst. And so my first mistake is I look over because my cousin's, I say mistake, because my cousin's face had pig snake face displayed. Oh, not familiar with pig snake face. Let me, let me just show you. Pig, snake, all right? So pig snake face was looking at me and I almost lost it. You know when you snort, but you kind of pass it off as a cough, you're like, <coughs> Excuse me. I'm so I put my head down so I couldn't see anything. But just as I'm getting my composure back, I can hear him. Psst. But I can't look, right? You can't look because you'll lose it. You know what I'm talking about. And I can already visualize it. I already know what his face looks like. And so I'm pinching myself and I'm trying not to, to you know, to laugh. But you Star Wars fans out there, you'll, you'll understand this reference. The Death Star tractor beam had me. It would not let me go. And so I didn't want to look. I didn't want to look. But as I can, I, I, ah, and I bust up laughing, I lose it. And I immediately was sent outside to the, the hallway for punishment. But if I was going to be out there, my cousin's fate was going to be the same as mine. And through the, through the window outside, I can see, and the teacher's back to me, I can see my cousin. And I was determined to get revenge against that Sith Lord. And so... He did not want to look, and I can tell, it didn't matter. Death Star tractor beam had him. And just as his face popped up, there was mine pressed against the window, glorious pig snake face. And we were immediately sent to the, both of us, had a nice walk to the principal's office. It was joyful. There was pain on the other side, but there was joy and laughter in the midst of a storm. 
it was such a great memory, not only for us, but for those who witnessed it. But years later, I ran into that teacher from eighth grade. And there were two things that kind of stood out to me. One was, she wasn't as old as what I thought she was back in the day. As a 12-year-old, I could have sworn she was 95, pushing it, all right? But in reality, she wasn't even 30 yet. So some of you teachers, that's what your students think of you. I'm just saying that right now. But it was such a great conversation. She had the biggest smile on her face. She wasn't teaching eighth grade anymore, or maybe it was just our class. I don't know. But there was joy. It was apparent that she loved Jesus. And there was so much, it was such a great conversation, but that's not how I remembered her. But the second thing that came up was her recollection of me. She said she loved my smile. She loved my jovial smile. She loved my laughter. Thankfully, she didn't remember that she sent us to the principal's office that time. She said that my love for Jesus was evident and that my joy was contagious. And here I remember that her class was boring. It was so sweet of her, though. But as I'm thinking through that, I was, I, it brought, it kind of reminded me and a sense of conviction as well. In the sense, I was wondering if she would still view me now in my adult years like she did back in my youth. If there's anything we should be remembered for, first and foremost, is our love for Jesus. And second, is how our love for others shines through with a smile, with a laugh, caring for someone as they go through difficult times, sharing joy so that others can see his light and be reminded of God's love. Let's be reminded not blinded. Be reminded of God's love so that we can share his love, share his hope. And it's not so much that we've forgotten that he loves us or that we've forgotten how to live with joy or that we've forgotten how to laugh, but rather we've become accustomed to wearing the blindfold and only focused on those things in front of us instead of focused on who Jesus is so that our lives can display his joy for all to see. And finally, here are four great ways the Bible reminds us how to live life because of God's love. First, number one, take the time to laugh. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Like we've talked about, circumstances can hinder us from seeing that joy. But the Bible declares right here, there is a time to laugh. Incorporate more laughter into your life. Play with your kids and play games and enjoy the company that you have. Call an old friend or a mentor and talk about funny stories or the, the things that you've gone through. Scare family members or pastors. Those are fun. But the point is, is that incorporate that laughter. Spend time around kids and, and the, the joys and the giggles. It's contagious. Or pets. There's people that love their pets. I love my dog, not my cat so much. Pets are from Jesus. Cats are from Satan. And so, but, but we, we, funny thing is that people think I'm crazy because of, um, I have a voice for my dog. I talk to my dog, my old English bulldog, Frank. Frank talks through me. But the funny thing is, is I, the crazy thing is, is that I respond to him, all right? It's like, I want some breakfast this morning. All right, dude, go get your bowl. Let's go do this. But the funny thing is I've been doing it for so long that my family responds to him too. Why? We're all crazy. No, because it's fun. Whatever you do, ramp it up. Find joy. Find laughter. Enjoy the day. Number two. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Don't keep joy to yourself. And we must also look for those times to be able to rejoice with others, 
to dive into that joy with others so that they can, we can experience that with them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Have you brought joy or laughter to someone today? If not, think of just one person that you can make smile or laugh or encourage or inspire. It will bring joy to both of your hearts. Number three, lighten your step. A joyful heart, this is the passage that we read earlier, but it's the, the, the full verse. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Have you ever felt your broken spirit and it saps your strength? And that next step is so heavy and you thought you'd never laugh again. But if you are a Christ follower, you are blessed to be part of God's kingdom. And so uh, allow the God of the universe to give you peace and comfort and the strength that you may need to get past that struggle. A joyful heart is good medicine. And, and, and being blessed is about experiencing the joy and looking past the circumstances. I mean, King David wrote about it this way. He says, you have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. Your goodness has taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy. Are you feeling burdened today? Ask God to take away whatever that is happening and to lighten your step so that you can joyfully dance. And then last bit, not least, number four, expect, expect great things. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Psalms 126 too. Expect great things. When, when, when God led his people out of captivity and brought them home after many years, not only were they, they surprised by his timing, but they were relieved and thankful that they, they praised him out of joyful thanksgiving. They praised him because of the great things that he was doing. It can be easy to kind of dwell on and to hold on to the things that are negative in our life. But remember, God does do great things. Keep an eye out this week for the things that he's doing in your life. Or, or remember the time that you were pleasantly surprised by God's timing. And praise him through a thankful heart. Listen, church. If we're consumed by the circumstances... If, if we're consumed or blinded by the darkness, holding on to a, a negative attitudes instead of, a, 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 instead of joy going through the process, not only will we shortchange ourselves, not living the best life that we can live, but we also may miss out on an opportunity to share Jesus with someone else by not displaying his hope and his love through our joy. And what a testimony that would be, knowing that we may be in a storm, but recognizing and remembering God's love for us. Remembering that there's joy on the other side. It's easier and still not everyone does this, but it's easier to, sh to, to, to laugh and to smile and to see joy when things are going great and still do that. But imagine the impact we can make, that we can have when we're in the middle of difficult trials. If we have a different perspective, if we see a joyful perspective because of our hope and our love for Jesus. so that we can live with joy for all to see. Even with the difficulties of trials and, and life around the corner and, and the, the endless failures that, that are in sight, 
It's so reassuring, it's such great news that the God of this universe loves you so much and is committed to our everlasting joy in him. Be intentional about starting your day with joy. It helps with our vision and changes our perspective. You may have to retrain yourself to refocus and see what God wants you to see, what he has intended for your life. But give yourself permission to enjoy life every day. Remember, true joy begins with knowing the God who created you and loves you. Take the blindfold off. Have a different perspective. Focus on him. Set your sights on him. Let's be reminded, not blinded.